Forum Borealis Paradigm Expansion Greetings from the North to the citizens of Earth. Welcome to Forum Borealis. Friends, today we'll journey into outer space. Far out, if I'm being honest. But if nothing else, it will be entertaining and hopefully also illuminating and inspiring. Depending on whether this podcast will end up with video illustrations, you may be in for a spectacular visual treat. But otherwise, we'll do our best to entice your imagination through sound. The area of investigation, which is tonight's subject, is as controversial as it is captivating. However, it is also ridden with fakery, foolery and ineptitude, as it is a final frontier, unclaimed by professionals and left to whomever bothers, and many do, for good reason. Whether you believe it or not, there is an enormous amount of evidence pointing to our solar system being permeated with intelligence in the form of ancient old structures, ruins, organic life and artifacts. However, there is also the danger of projection and paraidolia, as the mind can sometimes see what's in itself rather than what's there. That's why a few ground rules are necessary and such a matter must be approached based upon three sound principles. A scientific attitude, not the same as a debunking reflex, of course. A contextual consideration, meaning that there can be other aspects of substantiation, for example, evidence of obvious tampering, akin to cover-up that can flush out a criminal act or a multitude of anomalies in the same site, or other data which by itself makes a specific spot interesting. For example, the scientific acknowledgement of the presence of water will make potential images of lakes more likely. And finally, since so much of this matter rests upon the visual evidence, all sorts of photo expertise is required, as even the most elementary phototechnical phenomenon may be mistaken for something anomalous, which is why our best bet is considering shapes of an unnatural geometric pattern. Well, enter today's guest. He is such an expert, and only one of many who are concerned with locating, analyzing, processing, and revealing plausible visual evidence of anomalies present in our solar system. Andrew Alexander Curry is a Canadian artist and arts therapist with long experience in determining patterns. He's been making and studying art from his childhood, combined with a keen personal passion for all things space and science fiction. One may think it unavoidable that he would be attracted to this field. Born and raised in Vancouver, he earned a Bachelor of Arts degrees from the University of British Columbia, a diploma in graphic design and illustration from Capilano University, and a Master in Arts Therapy from the Vancouver Art Therapy Institute. With a love of all things creative, he is also part of the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Curry began his professional art career as a community public artist, collaborating with various neighborhood groups to create murals in schools and community centers in the Vancouver area. But his storyboard and concept illustration for film, serial television, music video industry and TV advertisement has reached a global level. As a freelance illustrator and graphic designer, he serviced individuals, corporations and ad agencies and has helped define the visual styles for renowned musicians such as U2, Mary G. Blige, Stevie Wonder, Justin Timberlake, Pharrell Williams, Snoop Dogg, Jamie Foxx and Maria Carey, to name some. Over the years he has worked in the West Coast film industry with such notables as the Coen Brothers, the Huge Brothers, Marty Croft, Harald Schwartz, he's actually a Norwegian director, Neil Bloomkamp and Sofia Coppola. 
His perhaps most controversial commission was his storyboard guiding the 2017 Budweiser TV ad called Born the Hard Way, which celebrated an immigrant's American dream during Super Bowl. Coincidentally, the ad aired a few days after President Trump's executive order banning immigrants from Muslim countries, and a brewing company was accused of deliberately creating the commercial as a criticism of Trump's policy. While some viewed the film as a positive statement about the US being a country of immigrants, some vowed to never drink Budweiser again, including a segment of which called for a boycott of the brand. It immediately became number one ranked Super Bowl ad campaign after accumulating over 40 million online views. As a beautiful illustration of synchronicity, the ad agency's name was Anomaly. Now, Andrew Curry's understanding of how forces of popular culture and marketing influences the minds of millions made him apply his extensive expertise in ads to push boundaries of accepted mainstream paradigms to continue the transformation of a collective mindset which he feels is restless and ready and ripe for real change. Foremost is the curious cross-cultural theme of the mingling of the gods in the affairs of humanity. Through the years, he has increasingly bumped up against the concept of of a long-forgotten past epoch of human history, including the species-wide amnesia about a catastrophic event in the distant past. Authors such as Dr. Farrell, Immanuel Velikovsky, Robert Temple, Graham Hancock, Michael Cremon, Richard Hoagland, to name but a few, have helped inform his perspective. He's appeared on several shows to discuss these ideas, including Richard Hoagland's The Other Side of Midnight, the LNM Radio Network, the Martian Revelation Show, Revolution Radio, and the Morning Star Report. I should briefly pause to point out that this is Robert Morningstar's radio show, and unfortunately we forgot to mention him in today's show, as he is also a well-known contributor in this field, but consider the due kudos hereby given. Andrew's ability to ask potent questions have led him to hosting several shows on the other side of midnight, but his collaboration with Hoagland goes further. He is also a key member of the Enterprise Mission's imaging team. With this group of experts, ranging from photographers to digital analysts, he is co-authoring a new book called Hidden Mars, A War in Heaven, which apart from an abundance of visual imagery, deals with the idea of a mysterious and profoundly ancient human history involving visitors from the stars. This is what has inspired him to apply his artistic skills and keen eye for detail to discern and interpret what seems to be evidence in the various space agencies' photographic records of succeeding interplanetary civilizations which inhabited our solar system a long time ago. His closest partner of the Enterprise mission team is Keith Laney, but he's also a member of UFA or the United Family of Anomaly Hunters, which is a collection of precisely Anomaly Hunters. And now, ladies and gentlemen, put on a helmet and lean back while we embark upon such a hunt. Welcome to Forum Borealis, Andrew. Hey, Al, thank you for having me. I am so happy to have you. Sure. Hello, everybody. (laughs) I just want to come off right off the bat, Alan, and say thank you for having me on. And I love your shows. I'm a fan. I want everybody to know that. And uh, I was really in shock when you asked me to to be in church because I've been trying to hook you up with all the colleagues that I have in this field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to give you kudos. You know, thanks to you. uh, I think you helped me with Laura London. Mm -hmm. Lovely girl. Fantastic subject. You definitely were one of the... The spiders who helped me with Richard Hoagland, and we're going to discuss him today. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, 
kudos where it's deserved, oh. for sure. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, we've been going back and forth. I guess I should just inform people immediately uh, for the longest time about this. And it's so funny because I wasn't originally intending to have you on. <laughs> <laughs> but we I found out, I discovered by and by that it would be the best choice for now, considering the topic. And I've already presented you so people uh, know your credentials. Yeah. And it's a pretty fresh topic for us, although we've been teasing with this topic for the longest time. Uh, we haven't really gotten around to get our hands dirty. So, f- bam, finally now, this the, your lounge, you're lounge, you popping our cherry on this. <laughs> and we're going to do more shows about this incredible subject. And people, you will hear that uh, my guest is a perfectly rational, <laughs> sensible, <laughs> normal human being. It's, it's not the people who are involved who are, are far out. It's the topic which is far out out when it comes to a paradigm yeah. this is paradigm we you know we we promote this show as paradigm expansion and today people you're going to get your money's worth ah. and I, I i thought maybe it seemed like you had a pretty good survey of uh, what's going on oh good. A wealth of information well i'm glad it's a such a crazy area yeah. it's a crazy area man i I know what I see, and I'd love to touch on a couple of different pros besides. I know we're sort of focused on Mars, but I'd love to talk about a few other, yeah. you know, when the time comes. we could, And then, and I'd like to mention a few of the people that I really respect within my colleagues. Sure, sure, sure. Yep. So uh, I want to introduce, like today, I- I'm going to have others on too, also people from the team where they go into specifics, but I thought maybe we should have like a survey show yeah, okay. where we talk about the phenomenon of, I don't even know if it has a term, but, you know, structures and ruins in the solar system. It, What's it called? Uh, the people that do this call it space anomaly hunting or space anomalies. That's kind of what okay, they, we can run with space anomalies. Yeah. I was thinking of a solar system anomaly, but yep. because space is a little bigger. <laughs> I, you know, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I, I personally, I, it's funny, I was trying to get push, pushing Keith at you just because he really understands all the minutia, but yeah. I totally get why you want to sort of introduce me because we don't want to frighten away the listeners with like this detail and that. And an overview is just so much better. And you're exactly right. Um, but he and I sort of were complaining saying, well, how are these really anomalies if they're actually real? Yeah. <laughs> they actually belong where they belong. But yeah, solar system anomalies, I think, is probably the best because that piques the interest. Yeah, and anomalies in the paradigm, obviously, right? Not in the yeah. in terms of actuality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are the anomaly. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> so that, and I thought maybe uh, you, you could tell about, yeah. because you, you don't seem to have a, a dog in the game. You seem fairly neutral. So we could like pitch different hunters out there. Uh, so people know, and the history of it maybe. Sure. Obviously give uh, Richard a huge credit here. And when I realized this is a huge industry, there's so many aspects to this and sources and books and websites and, and people. And, and then also the main... Uh, types of anomalies Mm -hmm. and also maybe the most famous ones or those that you think are best etc stuff like that i'm going to ask you okay yeah i'm i'm uh let me think about this so yeah because i could give us or the audience a little bit of an overview of what i think are some of the major yeah pieces in the background now in terms of the current stuff there's so much material um, but I can I can pinpoint the ones that I think are important in terms of a historical perspective. Mm. The, the the newer stuff, like the, the personalities are interesting. That's a whole discussion in itself. I don't know. I know some good ones mm. that I believe. And I've actually now gotten involved in a group just even today. I was invited into it. They're called the United Family of Anomaly Hunters. Mm. And it's a kind of a collection of folks that are um, looking into this. But I'll, I'll do my best. I'll, it's... There is a character out there, I don't really want to use his name, but uh. he often gets coverage on oh. some of the more tabloidy news, like online newspapers, especially the British ones. Mm-hmm. And he'll come up with something silly or he'll see something and then he'll get all like, – like his, his images or his – uh, stories are kind of cockeyed and they're weird. Oh, it's it's a psyop. It's to derail, right? Oh, we can discuss that. Yeah, okay. Because there's stuff like that. 
and that doesn't make them yeah. think we've come off measured and balanced, which is important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, making the common person yeah. thinking, oh, we Abs- are cooks when we are <laughs> going into this, which is the knee jerk for those who doesn't know about this that would be oh it's a totally whack whack a doodle yeah. it's that. like talking about flat earth to them right so we yeah. have to like ease into it and then we can go into sp- like you say this isn't a radio friendly topic no F- fortunately we have video makers but i don't know how many of these of our shows will be rendered into video and without that it's good i mean with it it's one of the best topics you can have actually yes if you put on some good images to illustrate it but without we have really have to stretch to make this uh, interesting but I, th- I think we'll we'll manage yeah, but yeah. I have to start then because you're a new guest uh, asking you just the basic okay. how you stumble into this field well I I've always been interested in space the solar system ever since I was a kid um, you know it really informed my early life a lot of science fiction and I, I am an artist so I, I, I'm constantly imagining new things. Um, I'm a pattern recognition person. And that's actually how I got involved in this whole thing with Richard. I, uh, you know, I sort of began moving into this area through Richard Hoagland in back, actually back in 2015. Um, before that, I was very much a follower, reader of Richard Hoagland's work, um, Dr. Joseph Farrell, who you've had on this, both gentlemen you've had on this show, um, and amongst a, a lot of other researchers. And, and the, yeah, what's fascinated me is this idea that embedded not just here on Earth, but within our solar system is possible evidence of, you know, of, of something extraordinary. And I... Um, to say the least... Yeah, to say exactly. And in 2015, when Richard Hoagland came out with his new show, uh, at the time it was called Other Side of Midnight, and it was linked with Art Bell, who was on the Dark Matter Digital Network. Excuse me, what's it called today? It's called the Other Side of Midnight dot com. Oh, okay, okay. Got yeah, you. it just it might might have been a legal thing there. Mm. And what happened is that I I realized he was coming on the air with his own show because at that before that he was always. Uh, Coast to Coast Science Advisor with George Nori, and before that it was Art Bell on Coast to Coast, and so sort of my way in was really much through Richard's research. And in 2015, uh, I reached out to him because he had said on air, "Hey, you know, let us know who you guys want as hosts or as as um, guests." And and mm. so I emailed him. I made some suggestions. And he was kind enough to respond, and it was like, holy smokes, that's <laughs> amazing. Someone <laughs> in the sort of public eye has responded to me because I'm just a guy that sits in the audience and listens and reads the materials. Anyways, it was one show that he um, was on. He, I think it was an open lines. He, he called it open mm. hailing frequencies. Like George Nori used to have. Yes. Yeah. And he, he had it on, and I, it was a young fella had called in and started talking about the – I can't remember the mission, but it was one of the Japanese JAXA, J-A-X-A, their space agency. It was some imagery that that one of their particular – I think it might have been the moon. Mm. Um, And he was – gone into all these questions about the moon and it sort of branched. He was basically attacking Richard. And at that moment, I had this feeling of like – I remembered something from um, Dark Mission, which was uh, Richard's book that he co-authored with Mike Barra. Mm-hmm. And it was a particular part of the of the uh, book where he was discussing um, the astronaut uh, oh oh Alan Bean who actually he passed away I believe a couple of years ago one of the well well there's a few astronauts left from the old Apollo missions mm-hmm. not many and I, it was a very specific moment that I wanted to for the first time in my life to actually call into a talk show mm. and actually say, Hey, you got to look at this point of view. And I didn't, but I sent this email in Richard came back to me and said, cause I guess I had made sense and I was cogent. He said, how would you like to be a guest? And I'm like, what? <laughs> kind of like, wow, you must have impressed him with your commentary. Then. Well, it, when Richard first approached me and he said, you want to come on the show to talk about Alan Bean and his paintings and what they're revealing. And, and I was like, what do you mean? I know nothing. I'm in. And then he, and he says to me, he goes, Andrew, it's a conversation. Mm. And he took a huge risk with me, right? And then we had yeah. just had a blast. So right. I ended up coming on the show, Al, and we began to discuss Alan Bean because Alan Bean was an artist. He was not only yeah. 
a military guy, a pilot. Yeah. Um, I know who you mean now. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Fourth man on the moon. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. And he was also an artist. And when he sort of left NASA and retired from that whole program, he launched into his art full time. And he basically created these amazing paintings, you know, both small and very large of his experiences on the moon. And that just opened up. And essentially, the idea was in his latter paintings, in his later paintings, he began to do things in his paintings that to me demonstrated, because I'm an, I'm an art therapist too. I'm not practicing, but I have the training as an art therapist. And I started to notice some things in his art that showed to me that he was trying to communicate something deeper about his experiences on the moon. Whether subconscious or deliberate, right? Exactly. I'm sure people like Richard would say he's deliberately seeding hints for us. But it may, as an art therapist, you know, it may just as may well be, you know, the parts of the programming coming through, <laughs> the suppressed parts. <laughs> it's, well, Richard, Richard is of the contention that those, all of the Apollo astronauts, something yeah. was done to their memory. And yeah. we, we bring up Kubrick's movie, A Clockwork Orange, this almost aversion therapy, this way to mm-hmm. stop people from, you know, they they start hacking if they have to. Oh, think. yeah, yeah. Old signs going back to the Nazis. This isn't the dispute. Yes. Man. Yeah. Yeah. And so so that's that was my sort of entry in. And then I eventually became part of what he, Richard calls the Enterprise Imaging Team, where we would look, or what we look at, we still do, look at all the different space agencies' imagery coming back from the many, many missions that we have going on in our solar system. Mm. And now, actually, and I want to talk about this later, even going beyond our solar system. Mm. But how did you uh, discover the the uh, entire field of anomaly? Uh, you know, never mind how you got involved practically and stuff. I mean, that's, that's a given once you wake up. But it, yeah. it takes a certain step to, to you know, peek into this... Um, or the world the dimension, so to speak. I just, I think it just comes back to when I was young. And oh, let me tell I want to tell you a really quick story now, and I'll try to bridge it to now. I, my, one of my earliest memories was as a toddler, and I was sitting in a movie theater. I, I, like I was two. I think I was two. And you were actually sitting in a movie theater? I was sitting in a movie theater. Yeah. I, 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 maybe I was older. I don't know, but I remember seeing this this round spaceship descending into a moon base. It was two thousand and one, a space odyssey. Ah, right. And it was the Ares uh, four or five. I can't remember the number, but it, it was the Ares spacecraft that was coming down. And I have this distinct memory of that. And all through my sort of childhood and youth, I felt Al more freedom in like adventure stories like Star Wars than I than I did even in, in the real world. And I remember there was this particular comic that I I used to read. I can't remember what it was, but it was this great space battle. And I used to read it. I was like 11 years old or 10. Mm-hmm. And I'd read it over and over and over again, looking at all the pictures. And I would play Gustav Holst's The Planets. Right, in, right. in Yeah, in particular, Mars. Yeah. And I would I would play that soundtrack on the record player, you know, the old vinyl, and I would just read this. And I don't even know why I was doing it. And I, mm. I just – so then, you know, I could have moved on, uh, you know, through high school and then into university. And I remember in a classical studies class, it was classical um, uh, Roman and Greek history. Mm. And it, it occurred to me because I remember hearing this all the way because I was, I was sort of raised a, a Lutheran – I uh, grew up Presbyterian. I, I've been in all the churches that my, my parents took us through <laughs> okay. in the Protestant side. But it, I always had this this question about why is it that God or the gods always seem to interfere in, intervene in human affairs? And it was always mm-hmm. this theme that stuck with me. So in my later years, you know, when I sort of started to, to read Richard's material and then I got into to Dr. Joseph Farrell's stuff and this idea of a war in heaven – it sort of guided me towards these this imagery that I started to see, like via Richard's stuff and then all the other people I began to get involved with. So it's mm. – I don't know if that answers your question yeah. now. But that- no, because but, – but there are many uh, sci-fi freaks who, you know, they, they become like uh, pseudo-skeptics instead. They uh, – 
they had this dream, they had this open attitude that all children have in their formation years, but then they something uh, snaps in them and they become uh, defenders of the status quo. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they become fetishists about the, what little nuggets are, are let out there. They, they, they don't go there. They simply just don't go there. And they may be passionate about space and all that. So there's a particular brand, a particular race, uh, so to speak, of uh, us who are fascinated by this material, who can afford keeping an open mind about... And um, I mean, I hate that term, open mind. It's just being rational, actually. It's just not putting... uh, In my view, we're not putting our emotional blockages... We're not projecting our human limitations, a, a filter on the material. We're actually trying to determine this as best and objectively as we can. Because, I mean, this may sound outrageous to people who are not into this field. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like I'm turning everything on its head, mm-hmm. accusing the, them, the, the deniers, so to speak, of being uh, the uh, superstitious and us to be the rational. But, man... It, when you start to pick into this, and we're going to do this now, today, scratch the surface, give a survey, you can't get away from the fact that there's something huge going on, as you understated it. And uh, God knows what, it, that's the fun part, speculating about yeah. what's really going on, who's in the know, you know, how, how far does this go? But it has the potentiality to be the biggest, quote unquote, use very beaten up term conspiracy theory ever like oh i actually conspiracy fact <laughs> well and and it's so it's ingrained in our ancient texts mm-hmm. the uh in our subconsciousness in our archetypes absolutely and you know like a, a movie series like star wars which we've we've come to the conclusion of, of the skywalker series as of 2019 um, and, you know, sort of George Lucas slash Disney's vision is now complete in that particular place. You know, yeah. I mean, they spent a billion dollars or whatever buying it from Lucas, so they've got to make their money back and make more movies. <laughs> exactly, but, that's what but, it's about. But I'd like to talk about that later, though, Al. I think okay. there's something really important about that, but I want to set help set this up for, for your listenership to, to get to that point. But I, I think that's exactly correct. And, you know, it's written not only – it, well, well, it comes through in the archetypes. It's it's, it's written in our in our ancient history. It's written in the science fiction yeah. in the science fiction stories throughout our our you know not only here in North America but r- right across the planet. Um, um, but it's also in the NASA literature, and that's another point I want to bring yeah. up. It's um, back to the sort of this idea of. of this Brookings report that you know you'll hear people more and more talk about that was a very hard document to get a hold of, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. But it's and now with the imagery coming from all of these different uh, probes that go out into our solar system, either visiting moons or comets or asteroids or planets, and either doing flybys or landing rovers, and I mean there's more coming. The imagery is spectacular and Mm -hmm. it is becoming to the few of us crazy (laughs) Mm -hmm. kind of a a, i mean it's funny i i i have i want to bring up some colleagues that i really respect again later on and i want to sort of attach their emails to you know uh, not their emails i'm sorry their 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 websites to what i what i when i present them but one of my colleagues his name is robert harrison he's another part of our enterprise mission he has a really interesting way of framing this whole endeavor, and, and um, he describes it as – well, it is speculative. I'm, I'm paraphrasing now. But the, the visual evidence, and that's what we have, is really showing itself to show that a lot of this stuff that we're seeing looks really structural, really geometric. And he says – he says in, in sort of the opening statement of his website – I I don't know because we're not there on emotionally I'd love it to be true but it sure is looking rather interesting and I think mm. that's the best way to frame it yeah. Alice because again it's it, like you said it's speculative until we set foot and truly exactly. walk around and we we just can't 100% say say for sure it could be some sort of projection. It could be a Jungian type projection. No, 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 no. Look, uh, to be clear, the speculative part is to explain 
to make coherence of the anomalies. But the anomalies cannot be questioned. That's yeah. they, they they just pile up so much, yes. so many aspects, and 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 so we know what's not true. That's the point. Yeah. It's like nine eleven kind of. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, to a certain extent, our subconsciousness and our projection will have a part of it, of course. Yes. But not like we're conjuring up phantoms in thin air. It's more like take nine eleven, right? We know what didn't happen. Yeah. But from there to say what did happen is another story. And that's the, uh, actually that boils down to how life works and science works too. You, you can uh, put out a hypothesis or a theory and that can be dismantled by facts. Mm-hmm. And then in science you have to come up with a new, a better theory. Mm-hmm. Now that, that's the problem. If you don't have access to all the facts, like if you're not having your boots on the ground, that's going to be the hard part. And that's where people will depart. Now, the problem is when they start bickering about, I mean, I wish people just could agree that, okay, we agree about what isn't. Mm -hmm. And then it's fair that we have different because in any field there becomes like fractions and and uh, even competition, unfortunately. But no, it's just that we don't know exactly what. But we certainly know what's not. And from there, we should just realize we all have a common, um, we're all at the same team, basically, of truth. And we're going to give props and kudos to many of those people during this show. Yeah. So, so that's that. But okay, let's, uh, let's actually start. Hey, I want to say uh, how I discovered this. Okay. Well, I'm not going to give you my entire journey, but I, I feel I need to explain to the listeners because... One of the best databases, and I, I, I'm not keeping track, and you're going to keep bring us up to speed, all that stuff, good. But me, I remember one of the most Im- impressive stuff. I think it was Richard was one of the firsts, but I discovered Joseph Skipper's database. Do you remember that? Maybe it's still out there. No. Really? Ooh. No, I don't. It's one of the best image collections online, uh, at least. Oh, interesting. A decade or two ago. I don't know if it's still there. Okay. Uh, maybe it is. Uh, at least his images is because he put out stuff that's just indisputable, like trees on Mars. Oh. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I may know what you're talking about. Water um, on Mars. Now was his. It's, and then back yeah. then it was ridiculous. Now it's like, hello, yeah, mm, there's actually water. Yeah, there's water on the moon, there's water. On, all the stuff that Rich has been claiming all these years, they always come yeah. after like decades and then admit yeah. a, a, f- a fragment of it, right? And, and gradually drip, 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 incremental admissions. But when you look at these pictures, excuse my French here, <laughs> pareidolia. And we can discuss pareidolia, but yeah. this, I mean, sometimes it is actually pareidolia. I'm pretty sure I've seen. Absolutely. Right. No, absolutely, right? Yeah. I've seen images. People make a bit. Yeah, that's in your head, mate. But <laughs> yeah, but some things you can't get away from. I don't know if this is going to be turned into a video, but if it is, man, there's so many great pictures yeah. that we could use. The the pareidolia. I, I love that term. You know, I mean, pareidolia is there. Because I mean, what is it? Uh, human beings have a have a, an ability to create a pattern to make sense out yeah. of nonsense. Or, well, guess what? That ability is not something that we should try to hide or bury. Because guess what? That's what we needed to do to see a cat's face in the bush when we were running around on a savanna, so that we could go, <laughs> you know, yeah. escape and not become lunch. Good point. Paradoila is, is even why we're able to communicate like this. Ex- Language. Exa- exactly. So it's, yeah, I mean, even, even your own um, plug-in into the wall, it was deliberately created to look like a face so that children right. don't put their fingers in it. Or at least that was somebody's idea. And I, I like that yeah, concept. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, anyways, it's a, no, I agree with you. And in fact, sometimes, but you're right. Sometimes this can go a little too far. Um, you'll get, because of the big, huge data dumps now that have been done, especially with NASA. In fact, Al, I, it was a, I, I can't remember if it was 2015 or it might have been 17. But NASA, and you can look this up. All of this stuff can be looked up. That's the beauty. Mm. Um, is NASA did a huge data dump, not only on Apollo, but they've basically opened up everything and said the general public can use our images um, – any way they want, as long as it's, you know, credited. And I don't mean use it in a way that's, you know, uh, what I mean is that you're allowed to abuse it. 
excuse <laughs> but me, no what? copyright, right? Yeah, not abuse, not abuse. No, it, not but... abuse it. But you can use it as long as you, you know, you, you reference where it came from, which is really important in this field. That you get some people who who put up materials and then there's no reference number, so it's really hard to verify or yeah. come back and look at the original raw data. But that was a very interesting um, moment by NASA and a very interesting announcement. It's even – I believe it's on their website, but I know you can Google it up and find the page. Oh, believe me. We, we, we do so many videos that we need to go through the copyright uh, har- right. endurance all the time. So, yeah, I love NASA for that because they have made our life lots easier. <laughs> well, hey, and one big reason for that announcement is – because in the past, you know, they used to like really – well, some people say they would obfuscate or hide, you know, images. and Redact. they would, Yeah, they wouldn't – and there would be things that are mixed up and files not put in the right place. And now it seems to be a lot more open. And, and so like why now in this time is there suddenly a change in the sort of – I mean it's not complete – again, when we get into sort of the Mars stuff, which is really my fascination mm-hmm. – um, I'll explain some things that were explained to me by some of the associates I work with that NASA still kind of doing some things. But yeah, yeah, that's the, because isn't it isn't the answer simple that now image manipulation is so far ahead that it's easy for them to falsify uh, source material. Plus, it's easy for them to deny stuff based precisely upon that anything can be manipulated. Yeah, but with this kind of data dump. And this is one of Richard's points. Are we talking raw data? The raw data, yeah. It come. It, they've put so much out there. They've put so much out there. I mean, you're mm. right. It, it because it is digital. It can be, you know, manipulated. But you, but there are ways of finding out if they've done that. It's more yeah. what they're holding back. And this is yeah. one of the complaints yeah. that some of our guys have is, and and gals is that uh, how far along, for instance, is the Curiosity rover? which is in Gale Crater right now on Mars. Mm. And by the way, that was a rover that was only supposed to last two years, and it's now gone on for like <laughs> seven and a half, eight. Mm. Uh, it's amazing. But my my um, colleague and friend Keith Laney, who to me is one of the premier you know image specialists out there right now, um, he thinks that the, the, the Curiosity rover is a lot further along its path than what NASA admits. And there's a very mm. obvious reason why that could be, and that is because they're running across things that they're not quite ready to show us with their camera. No, but, but I'm thinking if they're showing us what they're already showing us, mm. man, imagine what they're holding back. Because, exactly. the, because there, there are, they are, do you remember the statue image that came out a few years ago? That even got the most, you know, people who have no clue about this, just normal people off the street, even they went and said, Jesus, this have to be something. This well, isn't, it, you know what I are mean? You talk, are you talking about the one that looks like a man walking behind a hill? Was that, is it that one? Um, yeah, which one am I talking about? Uh, there's so many uh, statues. Uh, yeah. yeah but, but it doesn't even matter what I'm talking yeah. about uh, because it, it's the principle of it. There's so much out there now. And I have to oh. say, just, just to people are up to speed here, what we're talking about basically is most of this stuff. I see it as four categories. Correct me and put the record straight if I'm wrong uh, or imprecise. But as I see it, you have structures. Yes. That's one category, you know, all over the solar system, structures. You have ruins. I kind of distinguish that from structures, actually. Mm. Uh, But it's, of course, it's a part of the same uh, ball game. But structures, ruins, and I love what Richard says about it because he says the reason I'm not into Richard is not into UFOs. But this stuff is a this stuff is standing still. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unlike UFOs, they're so fluctuating, they're so vague. But this stuff you can actually pinpoint and do something with. You can even go there, and and that's a whole other matter. You know how they, you know, the conspiracy of why they ignore and don't then don't ignore the you know the areas that yeah. they should explore. But anyway, that's the two categories. And then there's what I would say um, organic stuff, biological stuff like trees and water and. Uh, just amazing like it looks like you could actually live there or something could live there that's the third yeah. and then it's the fourth which is artifacts yeah uh, I, I guess maybe uh, as a part of the the biological stuff I would also throw in of course creatures like animals and even humanoids 
but, but, but artifacts is the fourth. And I think most of the paradoilia will happen with the last category when it comes to artifacts. Yeah, and that's and and it's funny because I wanted to say this a little earlier, and I, now that you're you're giving me the opening, is yep. the what people start to do is they start to uh, use um, tools from like like let's say a, a, a program, a graphics program like Photoshop, mm-hmm. and you know like some of this material, like when you go to the raw data, let's say for instance, if you go to NASA's website, if you go to nasa.com. Um, just Google them and you can go directly to any of their missions like Curiosity and you can go right to their raw their raw images. And what people will do is they'll start to process it, to digitally process it. And sometimes it can go a little too far. You want to try to stay as close to the original as you can. But, you know, there is a certain amount of tweaking. Even the early pioneers um, uh, did did that. To, you know, like basically pulling out the contrast, um, you know, trying to oh, get... Oh, you have to when we know that it's been manipulated. And especially well, the old data, which was uh, not digital. It's, it's uh, right, it's it's harder for them to, to, to fabricate that. Yeah, they had to come up with a very different system. But you're right. But what people do now, and, and it's, it, it is a kind of a problem in in the area, is that there's just so many people involved in this area now. You You, you run across all these folks... And some of them are doing what what Keith often mentions is that they're painting the images up. So they see something, they think mm. they see something, then they start to basically use different tools, and suddenly they got a statue. And the problem is, Al, is that that stuff tends to become the sort of sensationalized yeah. Yeah. moments on some of these more tabloid electronic uh, newspapers. I know the some of those ones out of Britain will use... There's a certain fellow, yeah. I don't want to say his name, but but he, he... In fact, this past week, he did another one where he was looking at someone's work and he says, oh, there's a statue head. And it's like, well, maybe, you know, but... And then oftentimes we can't even name this stuff because, again, we don't really know. It just looks like something. And, mm. and oftentimes, this is the other thing, a, a lot of this material looks familiar this is the thing that's so Hmm. unusual is that especially on mars when we're when we got this little rover down especially right now in gale crater because these images are absolutely tremendous but it's down there on the floor it's giving us the ground data not only doing its experiments you know like with the with the uh the earth or i'm sorry with the 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 martian soil and and this and that it's the it to me. It's the imagery that I'm interested in, and it's. I mean, it's got ten. Apparently, it's got ten. The the rover. It's like a one ton, a little. It's like a small car, and it's got. I think ten different. Ex, uh, what do you call it? Uh, like cameras and experimental equipment. It it can do ten different things apparently, mm-hmm. and it's got a whole series of cameras that bring out these amazing pictures and. Yeah, no, it it but but we do have this problem where where people start to yeah. let their own and they're not, they're not doing us any favors. And I, in fact, exactly. I think if this stuff is real, we need to expect people doing that uh, deliberately in order to throw us off, because that's how we know they operate in all other fields, even even mainstream politics. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, media and 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 yeah. Operation Mockingbird stuff. You know, Intel and media is all all a yeah. part of the same bag. And so, if they're not ready to let all this out, then they need to throw in monkey ranches now and then. Uh, have you you know they, they did the same thing in the? I'll, I'll go back to nine eleven as a perfect conversion here. Right. <laughs> yeah, although it's very different stuff, but it's it has this in common that we're not. It's not supposed to be baked into the mainstream paradigm yeah and in order to keep it with a plague in order to keep it uh you know not accessible to normal people you have to taint it like that so yeah. so in some cases there are people who are running amok with their own fantasy and their own and everybody wanted oh i want to become a uh, discoverer of this or that right enthusiasm and also egos but sometimes it's actually mudding the waters on uh, order i think and it's hard to distinguish that because yeah. you do find in this – I don't even know what to call it because it's, it's – you know, it, it's almost like the Wild West, Al. It's like everybody <laughs> – anybody who gets – like once you start to see this imagery, 
you feel like you've been let in on a big secret and you yeah. and you suddenly feel very special like yeah. it, it's true that's just the way you feel like mm. wow i've i've discovered this incredible secret and you know i mean again like you say there's been people going all along and i know we haven't touched on that history yet but we'll mm. we'll get there yeah. um but it you when you see it for yourself and then you you start i mean it's almost like a personal disclosure like everybody's talked about this big d word when is disclosure going to come yeah. and one of the problems with exactly. one of the problems with a with a researcher like richard is that he often puts a date on it <laughs> and then that <laughs> particular prediction comes and goes but you know again like you said, maybe what his thing is is that he's so anxious for it to happen. What we find is ten years later, oh my gosh, he was right. Yeah. Like if you go yeah. back and look at his articles and look at his blogs and read a lot of his material, he a lot of what he has said has come true. He, even many of the most outrageous ideas uh, and suggestions have have turned out to have some credibility over time. And that's and like Richard say, science is nothing if you can't predict, right? Exactly. And one of the big ones was he was one of the first people ever to predict that there's probably an ocean under Europa. Mm. Europa's ice. And what did we what have we've seen now coming out in the last few years? Oh, geysers. Oh my gosh. It looks like there's water under the ice of Europa. Yeah, the, the, I mean that's completely uncontroversial. Exactly. Now. And the same with the water on, on the moon and water on Mars. I mean they exactly. they, they even admit there's ice cap. You know what? There's even uh, global warming or, or climate change, I should say, going on on all the planets in our solar system, which is, by yeah. the way, one of the big uh, aha moments for me of why it's not my car. It's not the anthropogenic yeah. causation. But you're right. It's um, uh, There's a lot of um, different uh, motivations going on. And in this field, uh, it's so important, like you said, to credit source material and to show your methodology. And there are Fortunate, and we're going to get into those people, uh, people who are you, you, you can trust to be serious and uh, well intended in yes, this. Sure. But I, I just want to say quick also that one of the reasons I also think they're dumping all this data may be that because I remember when you know ESA has been around forever, European, yeah. uh, but Space I agents. don't trust, uh, I maybe trust them less than I trust NASA. At least in NASA, we know there are dissents not publicly but but behind the scenes and and many of them have a friend up with richards although i think also people like richard are are vulnerable to become manipulated by plants uh, spooks whatever but chinese mm. indians russians everybody is out there now and there was this huge expectation among people like the coast to coast audience as to like, oh, now we're going to finally know the truth. No, they're keeping a lid on it just, well, maybe not just as much as NASA, but I think all this available material kind of adds to the pressure. Mm. Well, I, I think that like with all these space agencies, they all become part of an exclusive club yet again. And yeah. I think what we're seeing, and it's often you kind of have to look at the little signals that come out. There's a, it's a very interesting. You mentioned ESA, so the European Space Agency had a probe called the Rosetta mission, and isn't that an interesting name? Because <laughs> mm. they were basically absolutely referencing the Rosetta Stone, which was basically the, the the mechanism that allowed us to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics and be able to sort of open up that whole window of of the ancient Egyptian world. And this is what they do, by the way. This is what these space agencies do, is that they literally have this astronomical commit committee that decides on names for all of these probes and planets. I, I think they have like a team of Joseph Campbells when they gave names. Absolutely. And not just names, also symbols. Also the symbols. Oh, my gosh. It is <laughs> – and Al, it is, it is absolutely riddled with this ancient – mythology and religious yes it's this ancient mythology religion thing going on that a lot of these 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 approaches to certain meteors and to certain not meteors i'm sorry to asteroids and to these certain planets come at a certain window when certain stars are aligned in a certain way you can see these patterns this is one thing that richard does really well actually is he mm. can chart all this stuff i mean that's it's kind of beyond me what he does but but he does sort of show that there's there's these recurring numbers. Now it could be coincidence, but my goodness, um, I don't think so. 
No, I want to I want to briefly comment upon that because uh, it needs to be put out there, and, and it's not to put down Rich's or Joseph's hypothesis because they and many others say it's deliberate, and it is in most cases it is. Mm. But there are such a th- thing as uh, now we could probably uh, give more kudos to the approach that Laura has because there are such a thing as synchronicities. Yeah. So I've often been wondering how much that's the that's the challenge, right? How much of this is deliberately because we know they are flooded with masons, they're flooded with Nazis, straight yep. on old time Nazis. Yep. So how much of this is just and I I don't believe it's a message like some do. Uh, if anything, maybe an internal message. But if you look at, let's take the Masons. Mm-hmm. Many where very often when you do a ceremony and stuff, it's not to communicate n- neither covertly or overtly, for that matter, to to the ignorant masses or to the even to the insiders. It's more a paradigm where if you lay down. Stuff and I, I can talk with confidence about this because I have esoteric background. It's yeah. to lay down these structures, these patterns, in a specific way so that the universe, kind of, to put it a little new age, responds. So it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a magical act. It's a it's honoring stuff. It's like mm. uh, it's like when the, the the you know funny that we talk about religion because like you say it feels like we're in on a big secret i i'd say it feels like we have a religious revelation (laughs) that's what it feels like and and that's the point if the christian church does a ritual right Mm -hmm. it's not to communicate to the muslims or something it's to commemorate it's to kind of keep alive the vibe so to speak and that may be a part of the ritual uh, messing around let's not go too deeply into that aspect of it no. anyway because that's more for Richard but I'd say sometimes I think it's so amazing that it may just be the universe playing tricks on us because I've experienced the most amazing synchronicities where I know there's no sin and that's often distinguishes so-called conspiracy nuts right. from spiritual spiritual people think everything is the universe falling into place? Mm-hmm. Conspiracy nuts thinks everything is like deliberately manipulated by man. But I say reality is somewhere in between. Yeah, We are part of the universe and can do intelligent structuring of it as we do. And we're uh, being part of the universe. We're also at the receiving end where we see discover these patterns thanks to that innate intelligence in us to discover it. Sorry to to hijack your reasoning there, but no, I, I felt I had to put that out there. No, and I, I think you, I, I mean, like you say, if we, if we go down this road, we're never going to come no, back to no, the anom- anomalies. True. But but I do think that there is a pattern out there, and this kind of ties back to this concept that was our solar system at one point seeded? Were there star people? Because let's let's get right to the point. Yeah. That's what we think these space agencies are doing is is honoring quote unquote the gods. Somehow I don't know whether they're calling them or trying to put in place, like you say, almost like a like a like a oh, almost mapping out like a satellite send signal <laughs> out yeah. there. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, but we're it, it almost comes back to this idea that we're in a system that's in place and that at one time there might might have been a break you often talk about a, a war in heaven mm. um you know was there and richard and, and joseph and i mean the ancient texts talk about this like there was some sort of fall let's just put it that way and uh you know was there a fall in the physics it was, was there a system that was more of a higher consciousness that whatever that means but a higher way of understanding i mean was it in place and then something snapped after, I don't know, tens of millions of years when the star people left? I, it, it opens up a whole lot of stuff, but it all filters down to what we're seeing are remnants of something familiar. And mm. this is what we're seeing in the imagery. And this is what the early people like the first – look, the first kind of entry point into – from what I can tell – is sort of the late eight, uh, late nineteenth, early twentieth century when telescopes got better. Mm. So you had guys like uh, 
there was a couple of you can read this anywhere but there's a couple just i think they're worth mentioning it was two astrologers or i'm sorry astronomers um Schiaparelli, he was um italian mm-hmm. and flammarion he was french and they felt that they were seeing on mars uh mars being a really good target because it's it's bright it's it's red and it, it wanders around the sky and it's something that's been fast and relatively close of course and relatively close and especially yeah and and it's been something that's been sort of in the human consciousness for like in all of our earthly cultures yeah i mean they, they just did term martians right <laughs> Symbol yeah. of outer space creatures. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and and these early astronomers um, thought they were seeing canals. Like Schiaparelli called it right. A canali, right? And yeah. it was sort of misunderstood. It, it just meant like a, a like a channel or something. But I guess the English press got a hold of this and said, you know, there's there's intelligent life on Mars, and that was because the, the telescopes got better. And then there was these, there was these dark patches that depending on the season would recede and go back and it looked like the polar ice caps were were kind of like growing during the winter and then receding during the, the sort of summer months so mm-hmm. there was all this sort of speculation that they were starting that basically this crisscrossing pattern that was going on were intel or was intelligent design and it, and this is where a lot of that early ideas of like you know is there and a lot of the early science fiction films reflects this reflect this yeah so those are those are kind of our entry point into um this kind of idea and then it was soon discovered once um well then you have lowell percival lowell who was the american uh, he was a mathematician he was very wealthy he was i guess basically an amateur astronomer but he built um the first uh a telescope complex mm-hmm. at height away from the light of cities so he was the first one to come up with the concept of looking more clearly into the heavens and and he was influenced by these these early guys as well and he wrote i think three books about this about the canals of mars so we get this early you know sort of the turn of the century into the early 20th century this this real renewed vigor and interest in like mars for instance i then you know when we had the the mariner missions that came in the in the in the 70s it was soon discovered that oh no mars is just basically a you know, there were flyby missions and it was uh seen that it looked pretty much like the moon it was a cold dry mm. dead planet that's what it looked like the fix was in <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, everybody kind of and what what's so interesting? I want to tell you about a so there was a, a and and it, he's an artist, so of course he interests me, but his he was an American painter and illustrator. His name was Chesley Bonstell. Mm-hmm. And he was actually a friend of Richard's, which is so phenomenal. And Chesley began as an architectural renderer. Mm-hmm. That's sort of what he when he began his career in New York. And then he went off to do um well, basically, he's considered the 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 I guess the the father of modern science fiction art, and he you can see his work in in many things, but he worked very closely with two people in the early days when sort of NASA was starting to sort of launch into the solar system. He worked with Werner von Braun, mm. who we know who he is. Yeah. He's the father of. Yeah, you know, modern American rocketry. He was one of the paperclip Nazi scientists who came over after the war, et cetera, et cetera. And he worked with um, the science fiction writer Willie Lay. Let me make sure I get all my names right here. And they wrote these three books that were then um, – that were basically to try to sell the American public on sort of adventuring into the solar system because that was the plan. Mm-hmm. They were going to go out there and basically to justify the, um, you know, the, the tax – tax money that would have to go towards yeah. you know developing a, a new organization nasa and moving into the solar system but i want to one specifically talk about the last book that they they sort of uh, willie lay was the writer uh von braun was the science advisor and chesley was was the illustrator and the final book was called now the, the name i can't remember exactly no, but, that's okay. but the book it's 1956, I believe, and basically they were talking about the early part of – I read it. I, I was able to pick it up in my library. Um, the early part of the telescope, you know, the improvement of telescopes and how there was speculation that there was – looking like there was canals, just everything I went through. Mm. But that basically was accepted now coming into the 50s with improved technology um, that, hey, it's, you know, it's not – 
And this was before the Mariner Mariner flights, by the way, mm -hmm. um, from NASA. But there was this one painting that Chesley did, and it is like a, it was like I think it was a, a a ten by twelve oil painting. And again, the name the name escapes me. I, ah, I wish I, I had <laughs> I had it in a note somewhere here, but I'll I'll remember it. But anyways, it was a um, it was oh here it is. Let me just get it. I don't want to. Uh, yeah. The, so the book from nineteen fifty six was was called the Exploration of Mars, mm -hmm. and this particular painting was 10 point or 10 uh, 10 and a half by 11 inch oil on artist board right. and it's a monochromatic painting it, it has like no color in it and it was it, it basically shows um these tall tall spindly pillars and it is in the article or in that particular chapter they were saying well if there were structures on mars <laughs> they would look like this right. because it's one third of earth's gravity you could go a lot taller mm. with less material to support roofs, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, in this painting, if you look really, really closely and you can find it online, the there are two little astronauts. And one of the astronauts is holding up his arm. Well, they're both kind of holding up their arm. This is you have to look very closely. And in between the pillars, it's like it's like a ruined temple on Mars, is is the concept here. In between the pillars, Al is what looks like an elongated head humanoid thing wow. with its head blasted open with almond-shaped eyes wearing robes and slumped between two pillars. And if you stand him up, he would be definitely towering over these two sort of humanoid, right. more human proportion figures. And this was, this was of, of course, back in the day before those kind of archetypes were popular and all. Exactly. Before any yeah. of the stuff that we're seeing, mm. this was just like a speculative uh, or so-called painting. Now, Chesley Bonstill was a, was very much a sober artist. He did work in the film industry. He used to do the really the big, beautiful matte paintings that were used in a lot of the the sci-fi films that came out in the fifties. Um, matte paintings being like the basically the backdrop, but they're like of not of of, of a full size of a. It'd be like matted in in behind mm. the the actors later on. So he did have that sort of side to him. But t to me, I'm thinking, why would he put this little weird little scene in the middle of an of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of idea of this ancient Mars ruins? And why are they even writing about this? Because they've already in this book concluded, well, there's, it's just a dead planet. Nothing to see here. Move on. Yeah. Exactly. And yet they drop these hints out. Now, get this. In... I can't remember the year, but there, but it went up to went up an auction. This particular painting, and recently in the last few years, it might have been 2017, and it was evaluated at eight to ten thousand dollars U.S. Wow. on auction. Mm -hmm. It sold for a hundred and twenty-five thousand. Mm -hmm. Now you could say, well, it's just a, you know, like this is a one of those once in a lifetime. Paintings, you're never going to get this again, and that's absolutely true. But again, this you know, who bought it? I sure like to know yeah. who, who was it that bought it. Is, is it an, an inherent to what we're talking right. about here? So we have these hints that came out in the early times before even we started moving into the solar system. There was another liaison between von Braun and Walt Disney. Yeah, when our television started to grow uh, in the fifties. Oh yeah, and Richard makes a big deal out of this uh, Disney movie. Yeah, where, uh, and we put it out there uh, as an illustration. In people, if you haven't listened to our interview with Richard, check it out. It's a three-parter, and we made video for all three parts, and you'll see amazing footage, all authentic. But this part was like, uh, and Richard makes it. It's a kind of the same as the painting. He they show structures on the moon without yes. commenting upon it, just like a matter of fact, it's you know implying yeah exactly and and you could one could argue that well we were coming out of a time where science fiction was how well we it was just giant speculation about what was out there who is the other right like what's in the darkness what's beyond yeah I, I trust everything before the war after the war you can't trust anything because after the war it was systematically controlled all information exactly. but, but before the war there was chaos Nudges yeah. of truth could come out. They were honest in their speculation, and we wonder, we don't know, right? Because they obviously didn't. But at some point, 
probably during the 40s. And we have covered this in the show. Mm. And you're a listener, so you know. <laughs> but they got their act straight. And because of the war and all that, they managed to... It got a, a really in, a increase. In, so no matter if it's alien, reproduct, uh, back-engineered, it doesn't matter why. Joseph argues that we don't even need that. But we know they had means after the war yes. uh, as a minimum to know much more than they did before the war. And, of course, as always, this stuff is blacked. They don't share it uh, and, and never has ever. And when NASA, like this control organism, is put down on us, mm. uh, after that, you know, it's just anti the propaganda age, the 1984 Brave New World. It's just, it, thanks to people like you, we get bits and pieces of, of what's out there. And in this show today, we're going to give them examples. So they're going to get, so because what we're doing now, we're philosophizing around the bigger context, obviously, mm. but we're also going to give them specifics today. But uh, anyway, go on. Yeah, no, no, that's that's excellent. And but the whole idea is that that might have been, and I agree with you, but some would argue that that particular film that Disney made with Von Braun and this idea that this space probe was going around the dark side of the moon and then they let off a flare and they see these structures. Again, yeah. this is a film yeah. created by Disney. Yeah. Some would argue that it was the bridge between you know, science fiction where we have to get people accustomed at the time – to that kind of you know idea and then bridge it into science fact. Mm. Well, I don't agree with that. I, I agree with more what you're saying. I think that these were these were hints, just like the Bond still painting, to just let us know that somebody has knowledge about this, whether it's through telescopic means or some other way. Al. I, I don't know whether it's ancient manuscripts or uh, who knows how this information... Yeah, but if, if it wasn't for the evidence, I'd, I'd be inclined to agree with those people. Yeah. Okay, they didn't know, blah, blah, blah. But then we, we get all this evidence. And this yeah. is evidence that they would be potentially equipped to know ahead anyway. Yeah. Which Richard yeah. is one of those uh, proven. So, yeah. when they do, if they if they came with everything on the table and everything was open and you know okay and blah 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 and there was no evidence, it would be a different matter. But we know this stuff is classified. We know this is riddled yeah. with so-called intelligence community. Oh God, how I detest that phrase. <laughs> These spooks. It would be crazy if this wasn't highly cla mm -hmm. Everything was classified, e even after the war. First, during the war, obviously. Then after the war, Cold War, right? Which was yeah. just an extension. So it's, so it's not even incredibly naive and, and brain dead and stupid to think that, no, no, everything is on the table. It's, it's, it's almost a criminal act of reasoning to think that everything, if everything was on the table, all the heads should roll. <laughs> mm. It was never on the table. And... Yeah. What little we, 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 we do know just points and then we, we can go back and then we can see in retrospective. So where there someone in the know and then we see stuff like the Disney see, uh, movie. We see stuff like the painting you mentioned. Yeah. And then we can't afford any other conclusion that they may have been onto it and it's, it's uh, highly convenient how much this matches up. There's a million references in popular culture and, and stuff uh, leaking out even before the war that Rich has spoken a lot about. So, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not even important because what is important is that there is something there. <laughs> no matter if they knew or not. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and our first, of course, the biggest one that we get is summer of 1976. And the Viking missions do their flyby past Mars. And sure enough, you know, the, the lead scientist is going through all the images that are, you know, sent back, you know, sort of sent back to Earth. And oh, my God, this one looks like a face. Mm -hmm. And that started the whole face on Mars controversy. And that, to me, is probably the biggest entry point for the planet. Yeah. Al, like really honestly for this idea of space anomalies now i i don't know if you want me to get into a little bit of that history sure. or uh, yeah okay so because m most people today think it's been debunked but that's not true yeah no i don't believe that's true but the first two after the sort of lead scientist saw this his comment was oh it's just a trick of light and shading yeah, no. and and it was dismissed and and then they because remember it was a that particular mission was 
sent the Viking mission, the probes, I think were sent, you know, with kind of a 50, 50 between geol, you know, like in terms of geologists and biologists. So they were looking for life or some sort of evidence of, of life on Mars. That's what they say every time mm. they go to Mars, by the way. <laughs> and every but time they never explore the stuff that would be interesting in that uh, direction. So <laughs> I know from what I, we see, I mean, yeah, I know it's like a, person pony show on a constant yeah. basis but i think we're coming to something now which is really different but let's just hold it right there so yep. there was a uh, electrical engineer an uh, american electrical engineer and his name was um uh uh di pietro mm -hmm. and he when he first saw this sort of face it was in some magazine at the time called alien architect 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 or archaeology or something like that, and he thought it was a big joke. He thought, "Oh, that's just silly." He was a real mainstream guy, but apparently, he then looked at some point. He got a chance to go and look at the data. I'm not exactly sure why he went and did that, but he eventually looked at all the imagery that had come from that particular mission. Uh, it was either Viking One or Viking Two. I can't remember. Um, and he started to find not only one image, but misfiled was another image. And he, along with his sort of uh, friend and cohort, um, Molnar, Mar Greg, Gregory Molnar, I think his name was, he too was an, another sort of computer specialist. They created the first sort of imaging, you know, independent of NASA and independent mm. of anybody associated with that sort of realm, anybody in sort of in the mainstream. They kind of developed their own image processing techniques um, and you can read all about this in, in Richard's um, book, The Monuments of Mars. But essentially, they were the first ones to really, you know, pull out the details. And it's a very interesting read. So I, I would say that they were probably our, you know, one of our first pioneers um, in terms of, you know, like something that sort of made it to uh, mainstream. And, and I think l later on, it was Richard who held up the image on <laughs> image of the face on CNN and got himself in a lot of trouble. Yeah, he became a symbol of that whole uh, battle, actually. And he, he did all the uh, rounds on the big media. Yeah. And uh, I, I think he got lots of the fault, too, <laughs> when yeah. it was officially debunked. Well, it, and the face was located in, in an area in, in Mars in the in the north northern quadrant, Mm -hmm. um, of the planet of an area called Cydonia. And another feature that uh, Di Pietro Molnar also discovered sort of through looking through the NASA files, because remember, when they found the second image, one of the things about looking at this kind of uh, area of study or inquiry or like I, what I call the Wild West of <laughs> solar system archaeology or anomaly mm. hunting or what do you want to call it you it's really important to try to get multiple angles of if you see something that looks unusual or strange that has some sort of geometric features or looks like it's artificial what the best obviously the backup is to find another image that can sort of verify it especially if it comes yeah. from a different lighting angle i mean that just makes sense right mm -hmm. and they found it they found another image that had been, quote-unquote, misfiled. It wasn't even put in the right place. And so you can already see NASA was starting to tinker with the data. Yeah. Even though they had it out there, they were playing around with it. Um, but another image that they found, and this was something that we actually saw in Elysium. This this um, this was that whole Carl Sagan thing about this, these pyramids in Elysium. It was um, another NASA probe that showed these very, very strange pyramidal structures in the middle of the, of the Martian desert. Now we're getting these echoes back from Chesley Bonstill's painting <laughs> of mm. this of this um, strange temple. Now we're starting to see it in the imagery from the satellite imagery. But again, no, no, they're just mountains, and you know there are you know this is the, the again this is you know we no no we've debunked everything and this is what it is. But Molnar and Di Pietro, the the they found what they saw was a massive pyramid about ten miles from the face on Mars, or the so-called face on Mars. Um, and I should describe the face on Mars. So the face on Mars, anybody can look it up. It looks like... Yeah, everybody knows it, I think. Yeah. But, but, but they don't know the latest, because it's not a human face, is it? Well, it... Okay, so I have my thoughts on this that I never really shared with, uh, with Richard and those guys, because I, sometimes I think, Al, um, people get... You know, they build up something so much that... They think that I, how do I say this? They get married to it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because 
what we're seeing more and more when, when we've been doing this, these studies on Mars is that it looks like Mars was hammered yeah. by something hard and it caused we, – we believe the, you know, Mars was covered in oceans and now the mainstream is saying that. Yeah. That at some time – well, they're saying, I don't know, two billion or three billion years ago, there was ocean, you know, sort of – yeah, And that fits, that fits with the exploding planet hypothesis. You mean – well, in terms of the timing, I, it depends, right? It, but – but anyways, it's something catastrophic happened on that planet, mm. and we see evidence, especially in a place like Gale Crater, because the rover is sending us these amazing images of something having washed over. And from the satellite imagery, you can see the damage coming from a certain direction, right. and I believe it's northwest. And so the the the, the face on Mars is looks like it's half human and half lion, yeah. but – it's the left side of the face that would have been where the wave, if there was right, a tsunami, right. hit it. And it, to me, it looks like it's been damaged. So right. I think, and this is my speculation, is that it was actually, if this is really there, it's a humanoid face that was basically damaged. And it's funny, Al, because right. if it did get damaged and look like a Leonid face, and we and I know Richard talks a lot about you know sort of the importance of lions, and we see this through all our sort of earthly cultures – how you know what how lions are associated with us isn't that interesting how nature <laughs> through yeah. a disaster kind of potentially created a paradoia effect of a leonid form yeah. a pattern an archetype that sits underneath it all now i this is right. my, uh, my my crazy speculation off of their crazy speculations yeah, yeah, yeah. but to me it looks damaged yeah but if it, if it wasn't a structure there we wouldn't see anything anyway exactly so, yeah. it's mm -hmm. exactly right and and so in this Sidonia area there was this giant pyramid that was about I believe it's a kilometer long and it's a couple of kilometers high aren't they lined up those three pyramids just it, like those on earth there's a whole series of pyramids and, and weird anomalous structures in the Cydonia area. And that's what Richard also became very famous for, yeah. is that he basically, in his Monuments of Mars, in his sort of movement through this material and looking at the imagery, said there was a city. And I'm telling you, Al, it looks stunning. And this particular pyramid called the DNM Pyramid is a five-sided pyramid. It's absolutely massive. And it's what we call now... A giant arcology and an arcology is essentially a habitable a very massive habitable space that would like be a habitat for like a town or a city just mm -hmm. basically like perhaps hundreds of thousands or thousands of people and that term arcology actually comes from an italian um architect whose name escapes me again but you can look it up arcology is really simple and in yeah, fact hang on how is it written because it sounds like you're saying archaeology no, Arcology. So it's A R C O L O G Y. Okay, Arcology. Yeah, like the they are the like the teachings about the ancient stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. and so the Arcology concept it, it's actually it originally came from a, an Italian um, architect who who talked about creating this in the future. It's a good word, I think. Yeah. Mm. Well, and it's funny, man, because. There are plans now, at least in terms of on the drawing board, of creating pyramidal like arcologies right, in, right. you know, the, in, in maybe sense. Dubai. Yes. Oh my gosh, it's mm. amazing. Especially if, well, if our current climate keeps going whichever way it's going, we, you know, we, we might have to retreat into these yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. So that's like really the early, to me at least, the early look at, um, you know, where this all sort of stemmed from. And, when you ask about well, what's the update on on the face? Well, there were later you know images that came from you know later missions that I remember. Uh, I think the term was from Art Bell. It looks like a cat box. It looks like uh, the images that came through look worse than than what my cat does in in, in its uh, in its litter box. But Al, one of the things I've talked to Keith about this, Keith Laney, who we'll talk about later. Um, he, again, one of my colleagues, absolutely fantastic image specialist. I've asked him, I said, why are we not targeting the the face or whatever we want to call that, you know, thing? Why are we not targeting that for more inquiry? And he says, that's a really good point. We should. Because a lot of the times you can actually, you can actually ask for certain 
um, NASA um, satellites or probes to actually go and take pictures of certain things. Like he, Keith has done this, and the people who are really in the know can go and actually, you know, literally not like ordering a, a hamburger and fries, but you you can put in a request, and as long as you give a really cogent explanation of what kind of science you're pursuing, they will in time potentially take pictures of the sort of well, they would call it mesas, mesas and mountains that you are interested in. So mm. that's available. That's available for people out there. And there's, like I said, there's just many citizen scientists now. I mean, I I come into this as an artist, first and foremost. I mean, that that's my sort of entry in, and I'm a pattern recognition person. So a lot of the work that I do, if I may just interject with this, is, you know, Keith and Richard and, and others have asked me to sort of look at the imagery, whether it's satellite or right, right down on the ground, and, and sort of you know, illustrate it, like draw it out, make it a bit mm. more clear. And this is, hey, this is a legitimate practice, Al, because um, I think it was last year I found an article of these 4,000-year-old sculpted camels found in Saudi Arabia on a, like a like a rock face. It was a, like a really small mace. No, it's not even a mace. It just looks like a part of the, an old piece of, uh, like, you know, it's about 25 feet, 20, 30 feet high rock face thing and you can see these camels were were engraved on and they don't really know you know who it was that did it and so the archaeologists within the article have sort of continued the sculpture in their drawing so it's like when i'm doing this it's not necessarily like i'm over speculating because this is no, uh, no. yeah so anyways no they use it in all fields even in space uh, you know it, it, Mark McAndlish, yeah. but people who who are hired to do work like that. But I should say that uh, on your team you have a lot of image experts, and that's important because yeah. it starts there. We can leave it to the geologists, biologists, psychologists, whatever is. As soon as we know the evidence is true, but it starts there, and that's what they're attacking. So I love that there's so many in this new book. Uh, what's it called again? You can plug it now. Um. um. <laughs> war in heaven war in heaven yes yeah yeah oh my gosh oh my god i'm having a hard time. hang on <laughs> i should know this al this is terrible you're one of the co-authors yeah but here's the thing on that team most of you are image experts right yeah and yeah. that's important that you cover all bases all different angles because then they don't have that anymore then they need to start debunk and distract with all the means yeah, I think it's. I think we're calling it Mars: A War in Heaven. Something. Anyways, it's yeah. it's still a working title. Something like that. Pretty poetic. It's well, it's a huge tome. You know, it's becoming like that, and it's becoming a little bit unmanageable because the longer that we sit on it, the more data comes in. And but you're right, yeah. we're all coming from it from a very different perspective, and each one of us is sort of contributing, um, you know, to this. You know, and it is based on Mars, and it's this idea that we're not only finding, like you mentioned earlier, massive arcologies, massive structures like like bisymmetrical five-sided pyramids and many other kinds of pyramids like that that NASA and geologists and planetary scientists would call no 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 they're just they're just mountains and we mm. can see evidence of that on earth well they sure pop up pimply like in the most you know extreme desert areas mm. all of a sudden there's nothing else except one sort of structure sitting up and it looks pretty balanced um so, okay, if if that's what you guys want to call it. But we, you know, uh, even have from the satellite imagery when, again, some of this stuff is, has been badly damaged because of what we think was a massive tsunami that swept through over the planet, is out in these giant pyramids, in these giant arcologies, looks like – it looks cellular. They mm. look like rooms. They look like like collapsing internal – rooms and they're massive rooms oh excuse me and this is the kind of stuff that we glean from from the satellite imagery um down on the you know when we get in the book when we when we finally finish it and get it out there um we have this sort of ground truth with the rover with with the uh uh, uh curiosity rover and we're seeing stuff on the ground that looks like old machinery mm. there's a very there's one in particular is and again, people can easily look this up right now. So it's called the pump. And I, I'm not sure if that's what it's called. I mean, you can find it anywhere. Just go look up Mars and look up the pump. And it is the most extraordinary anomaly. It literally has pipe sticking out of it, Al. And it became sort of a sensation a, a number of years back when 
whichever um, image of the day came out for you know remember um, on the Mars on Mars the days are called Sols S O L and it was and it's because they have a slightly longer day and they don't want to confuse it with an Earth day et cetera right. et cetera so right now I believe that Curiosity is up to about. 2,650, so they're like salt 2,650, some, somewhere in there. So about seven and a half, close to eight years now that the rover's been going. That's a lot of data to go through, but there's a lot of people looking through it. But what we're seeing is stuff that looks like machinery. Mm. Uh, one of the guys on our, on our um, group, he actually did a, a complete analysis of it, and it looks like part of it's corroding. Mm. We have You can see these sort of like really round – tubes coming out and if that's mineral deposits that are just popping up and turning into perfect circles and perfect long hose like not hoses long pipes then then nature is amazing yeah. other other items there's um oh you you just find all kinds of stuff on on the ground in in gale crater again the the, the planetary scientists the geologists will say no 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 those are just minerals being uncovered because remember mars has a thinner gravity so a lot of this stuff is preserved. Like you could say, well, how old is this? Well, we don't really know. And it goes back to what you just said. Yeah, because I was thinking if it's corroding, it proves it has an atmosphere. But if you look at the unredacted pictures, and Richard uh, shared some and be given evidence for why it's like this, you can see that they are manipulated. Uh, they overly try to make Mars reddish, yes. des- desert-ish. But it actually has a blue sky, which, which, science bam, comes to help. Because if it has a blue sky, it tells us something about the atmosphere. Yeah. And it kind of looks more like a more like a, a, a desolate area on Earth. Yeah, it looks like New Mexico or Arizona or something like yeah. that. It's unbelievable. And we know that Mars has some remainders of an atmosphere. Absolutely. And the sky is blue. Yeah, even officially. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, it, but, but the fact that there's water and ice shows that water is going in... It's a part of the, it's still an eco cycle going on. The fact that they have bushes and trees, some trees are huge, shows that some adaption of life has managed to survive. Now I'm going to have one uh, and I'm going to do it this year because I've been postponing and postponing, but I'm going to have on Dr. Brandenburg. Oh, and of course, you know his approach, right? That's, yeah. uh, he's proven that. And we know this from the signature, but he'll explain it that there's been nuclear war going on there. Right. Or, uh, I shouldn't say war, but nuclear disaster. Uh, you know, just a b- b- war is speculation, yeah. but to boil it down to what we can say artificial nuclear weaponry or, or artificial nuclear disaster. So that can explain some of it. But I think the most logical explanation for how basically half of Mars is blown away mm. is that it was turned towards uh, Ceres or the original Ceres when it exploded. And it, it does fit with the time scale because Dr. Tom and Flandern found that yeah. Right, and, and he found yeah. out also that all the meteorites or whatever is called comets, all that stuff, can be tracked to one common origin. Yeah, which is bam when that happened, which is millions of years back. I forgot the exact number, but that's two options, and I believe that oh, there's a limit to how accurate you can be in this stuff, even with yeah. the best of science, right? But if it's in the same ballpark of time frame, I think we're having a very close. Candidate, not discounting the nuclear. Of course, I mean that may have gone off. As a, if something like that would happen to Earth, a meteorite, something bam, then we will see the same thing going on here. Nuclear disaster, even though it's no war. You see what I mean? Yeah. So and, and tsunamis, yes, of course, that would be the first thing that happened. So I think it's all connected. Oh, but ab- of course, this yeah. is speculation. But it's it's oh, yeah. it's informed speculation, if you see what I mean. What- that's the whole point. And we can literally possibly – well, one of the dates is 65 million years ago. Yeah. I, I believe that's one of the dates that um, Ben Flanderen mentions. Um, and that would – wouldn't that lovely coincide with what happened on our planet? <laughs> dinosaurs? I mean, you know, yeah, exactly. The mm. end of the dinosaurs. And in fact, there was um, – you know, they're always trying to back up more and more science of, of how, you know, of the theories, like you say. And there was actually just an article that I read, I believe, from last year talking about a very rich uh, trove of, of um, like, uh, uh, evidence that's showing that there was a – there was a – I forget where it was. It was somewhere in South America. And it 
was like a, a like a time capsule that that goes right back to 65 million years and had many different flora and fauna all in one place. And it was an incredible article that I read. I hate this. I wish I had like <laughs> multiple screens in front of my face to bring all this up. But something happened 65 million years ago. It's, it's proven in the records. And and it could have been a time when – and remember, like one side of Mars is really splattered like, like as if it's been hit by a yep. – by a shotgun and the other side is actually not bad right yeah they wouldn't have war just on the north part to put it like that and no. and another thing it fits also with the mainstream hypothesis because if some heavenly body did struck earth that would be a given if yeah. the, one of the largest planets in a solar system exploded so close to us right yeah <laughs> yeah mars got a beating but we survived somehow yeah exactly and adapted yeah, exactly. And but it, it you, no, you're right. Is that these time and when we look at someone like Michael Cremo, who I do believe you've interviewed on on your yeah. podcast, yeah, and he can point directly at the archaeolo- archaeological record and show put on the shelf, quote unquote, metaphorically speaking, is a ton of evidence showing that there's these weird anomalous uh, tools and 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 um, um, even well, tools for sure, like in really, really ancient strata. Mm. And the way that modern archaeology tries to explain is, oh, it fell down through a crack. And when, you know, it's like, oh, come on, <laughs> yeah, you guys. So you're right. A lot of this starts to line up. And it's interesting. I don't know if it was on your show, but I remember a few years back, Dr. Farrell talked about, this is such a huge story. This this mm-hmm. This story about humanity, this story about maybe our true human history it's so old and it's so fragmentized that it's mm. going to take so many people and so many libraries mm. to figure this all out. And this goes back to something that you said earlier, that what I notice in this sort of field of endeavor, this study, is that there is a lot of ego. There's a mm. lot of people that get very possessive about kind of coming be- part of this secret, like this, this, I mean, it's not a secret. I mean, NASA's putting it out there. Public secret, I guess we can call it. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's sort of, t- on a lot of different levels, it, it taints what we're trying to do because, again, it can, there could be some troublemakers that are put in there on purpose mm. and there can just be those that are just so wrapped up in their own world. It comes with the territory. It's unavoidable, especially yeah. when it's not regulated or uh, official, and when it's a free, fr- it's, t- it's, like you say, it's a new frontier. It's an absolutely new frontier. <laughs> (laughs) anything out there (laughs) everything goes man like anybody can say anything and that's half the problem is that it to bring any science to it to bring a like a geological scale to it hey the current head of nasa dr jim green i believe his name is Uh did an interview with uh one of the papers out of britain out of out of the uk and he said the next two rovers coming out whether it be the um, the, Euro- the European one that's coming up or the new NASA one. They're both launching this year in 2020. And he says within the first few months, as long as they get to Mars, they're both going to Mars. He says in the, in the, in the first few months of 2021, there is a very good chance that we will find an amazing discovery. Basically, he's saying either evidence of past life no. – or evidence of present life. Now, they're going to frame it with a very careful butterfly net. We all know what a butterfly net is. It's a delicate net that catches butterflies, right, mm-hmm. so that you can pin them to a wall. So they're going to use a butterfly net in terms of microbes. They're going to say the first level entry is going to be it's um, we're going to find a microbe on the edge of yeah, a – Yeah, but the, the damn microbe thing, they should have done that back in the 1980s. They've been flirting yes. with disclosing that for so long, and they can't even give us that. So it's going to be an anticlimax if in 2021 or whenever that's what it's going to be boiled down to. Maybe because I think they're wrong. I don't think the public is at the level where a micro will be like a big deal. I think most well, of that's the, the, so, right? They're underestimating. Yeah, well that, yeah, that's what he says. Like he, he goes, I don't think humanity is ready for it. And I'm, think, I'm reading this going, you guys have gone through like a – what is it 50 years of acclimatization mm. <laughs> like of course we're ready for it i mean it's it's primed and ready look look we i, th- I think we're ready even for ancient structures and ruins well that 
You see, that's what I think is the next step. I, I don't think they're ready for a current, like there's an alien base there. I, I think that could freak out uh, a few religious people. But even just saying, look, here's evidence. Somebody lived here. They were intelligent. That's it. But, you know, it's not about being ready. It's about everything that will unravel. It well, may dismantle the current status quo, actually. It's, well, Al, and the other part about this is that within that, that interview, he says... Hey, we're finding so many exoplanets now, meaning planets mm. in star systems outside of our solar system. We're finding so many now with these tremendous telescopes, these, these mm. telescopes not just here on Earth, but out, you know, sort of going around Earth and, and, and you know, sitting in spots where they have even, you know, more chance to kind of get through the – through space to see new planets. He said quite directly – this is the mm. NASA head scientist saying – there's probably other civilizations out there. It's like, oh my gosh, they're they're laying it out. But it's again, it's a slow disclosure. It's a slow, too little, too late. And and with the classified space program aspect, uh, or guest, he 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 felt that the data suggested that they're even exploring these places. And I bet if they find life, first off, they would never tell us. Never. I can give you a million good reasons for why. Good reasons in terms of how they are thinking, right? But second, you know the popular movie Avatar? Yes. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> that would be like a beautification of what would go on. Mm. Imagine what they would do if they found life there. No matter how intelligent that life is, as long as it's below us in terms of being able to protect itself, they're going to be right. doing. They're going to make the the transatlantic slave uh, trade look like uh, a Disneyland uh, event. <laughs> I'm telling you, oh man! If they can make look at what they're doing to people, even today, who are human beings, imagine what they can do to someone who they don't even feel. Uh, well, I, I believe personally that Homo sapiens are across the solar systems, but. No, it's 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 going to be horrible, man, and and that's going to be also a reason to keep it. It's all about money. It's all about profit, uh, resources, and power. Of course, it's about all the old game, same playbook. So, uh, so I think, but for us, it's not so much the current stuff. Uh, I mean, in this field, it's the, what really tickles the imagination, and because I think it's a lower bar actually to say, yeah, there's some. There's a, there's a planet out there with water and insects and whatever, right? That mm -hmm. they can do. They cannot say that in our solar system, connected to Earth, there's been ancient civilizations. No. Maybe even connected to Earth. Because that will throw everything out the window of and, what they want us to think and believe, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, for me, I mean, again, now I'm really just <laughs> coming from a place of like, this is what I think. Of course. I think it's a series of steps. I think it begins with this first announcement that a you know we either find microbial um, fossilized microbes or we or we found current ones that are on yeah. But they had chances to do that seventies, eighties, nineties at Antarctica. It's so old. But okay, let's say they start with that step now. Go on. Well, I just never heard NASA directly say basic because another part of his interview is he goes he said. Uh, Oh, I, I'm not. I'm not announcing it. I'm not saying that this is an announcement. I'm just saying that this is what could happen within a few. Like, no. okay, come on. You're basically yeah. telling us that's what's going to happen in 2020. Get ready. Yeah. And so you've you've laid out the playbook. And and what's the next step? Well, we go. What you say, Al, is so true because we got to go to the Brookings report. I, I know. I think Richards probably talked about this. Yeah, he mentioned it in in the past and do you want to you want to go over it with, or do you want me to talk about it a little bit or just yeah yeah we'll be soon closing up to the break but uh, yeah we can okay. throw it in there yeah so in 1959 i think it was uh, around the time that nasa was you know uh became a real thing in the united states basically their space agency they commissioned the brookings institute which is like a think tank in washington dc uh which is basically an assemblage of all kinds of you know, elites. brains, yeah. elites, yeah, from um, all sciences and economics and anthropology and, and everybody to basically look at what it would mean to humanity as the U.S. would go out into space. And they had a big, long, fancy name for it. I think I have it here. Uh, so the report came out in 61. Hello? Hello? Yeah. 
Convenient timing. Yes, I'm back. Hi, Al. <laughs> Convenient timing, huh? But yeah. um, no, shit happens too. So let's not look for patterns uh, no. where we don't have to. But you were going to ease us into the Brookings thing. But before you do that, actually, I yeah. just want to say that uh, you mentioned that... Uh, they're doing this data dump, and uh, but yes. but uh, that has to be more modern stuff because for one thing, and I asked Richard about this too, they they, they threw away their original data, the old stuff. Like there's a lot of lost Apollo tapes. I think Ken yeah. Johnson came into this. Yeah. Ken Johnson, we know, kind of was a whistleblower actually because he yeah. took he was asked to destroy it, but he he took care of it. Good yeah. thing he did. And they found like in dumpsters, random dumpsters behind McDonald's and stuff. We had these things where they found original footage that they just tried to get rid of. Yeah. And um, we, of, of course, know from several whistleblowers that they have like people who work. I don't think Carol Rosen is one of them, but I forgot the name. There are people working for them to redact and retouch. I mean, that's where the people like you would be hired by them. <laughs> oh, there is a lady. Yeah, you're, you're probably right. Yeah, there is, a lady. There was a lady that did that, and she was came out and started to do a lot of interviews. I forget her name. Why do yeah. I forget her name? Me too. I don't know. It's probably the hypnosis thing. So, <laughs> But here's the thing. We know that uh, NASA has been corrupt like that. Oh, yeah. And Richard also blew the whistle on the fact which many people oversee – that NASA is a part of the military Absolutely. Uh, structure complex. Yeah. Not like this is this, uh, you know, I, I, I see Werner von Braun with a pipe uh, and I, I'm so comforting and cozy and I'm your friend, right? That mm -hmm. image thing. It's an old propaganda op. And people still have that. The naive uh, people in the field and also the pseudo skeptics. So we know all this stuff and. We know that, uh, so it's a military, uh, yeah, and now we know that yep. uh, starting with after they finished off Kennedy, and I think he's connected to this too, but we don't have to go there. But after they finish him off, then they start the, pro I thought it happened on Obama, but no, no, it started already, uh, who, who took over from him? It was, um, next president after Kennedy was, uh, oh, uh, after uh, LBJ. Um, Nixon? Was it Nixon? Uh, or it may have started already under LBJ, yeah, but they started to yeah. privatize stuff that was supposed to be run by the public. And today, almost nothing is done by NASA, except they have uh, um, the, the team of uh, scholars. But much of the practical stuff is done, boots on the ground stuff, and that's what's count in this area. Is done by the private contractors, the multinational globalist oligarch corporations. So yeah. they would know lots of stuff that we, that, so I, I believe parts of NASA, huge parts of NASA is gullible and, and sincere in a way. It's, it's compartmentalization, right? The right hand doesn't know what left hand, but yeah. within that, many of them, and, and many of them know something is going on. But anyway, bring us back to the Brookings. Oh, are, are we on air? Yeah, yeah. I started uh, oh, like long ago, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <no. laughs> I guess we are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so Brookings, I'm going to give you the, the, the full name. So it was called 1961 Report, The Proposed Studies on the Implications of Peaceful Space Activities for Human Affairs. And it's better known as the Brookings Report. And basically, it, you know, when I read it, it, to me, it focused more on what would be the technological changes that would happen as NASA begins to step into the sto solar system and starts to, you know, basically go and look at and see what, what's out there. Mm. So things like um, uh, miniaturization of technology, uh, new propulsion systems, uh, telemetry, uh, these kinds of things, and is to me looks like that was the emphasis about also. Um, how uh, business and privatizing would be would would have this huge effect as we start to potentially habitat, you know, on different planetary bodies. So that's where the focus is. But there was a, there's a very curious part of this report that talks about. And Al, may I quote it? Is that sure, okay? Sure. Okay. I want to. It's really quick here, but it's something that comes up in the introduction. 
it's something that comes up in the index. It's something that comes up in the abstract before the whole report, and then it comes up in the report. And so repeatedly it comes up. Mm -hmm. So it is conceivable that there is semi-intelligent life in some part of our solar system or highly intelligent life, which is not technologically orientated. And many cosmologists and astronomers think it very likely that there is intelligent life in many other solar systems. Mm -hmm. While face-to-face -face meetings with it will not occur within the next 20 years, parentheses, unless its technolo technology is more advanced than ours, qualifying it to visit Earth, close parentheses, yeah. artifacts left at some point in time by these life forms might possibly be discovered through our space activities on the Moon, Mars, or Venus. Mm. Now, that's right in the report, and it's repeatedly, you know, said. And, at, you know, for the longest time, this report just was in the shadows. Like, no one even really knew about it. Um, and then when Richard kind of flamed it, I think he was alerted to it by people that were on his uh, team at the time. This goes back over a duh, decade and a half ago, maybe. Mm. But... Now, you know, it's now out in the open. NASA, you can find it right on the NASA site, and it's totally open. It's a very, very interesting statement because literally everything that we've, you know, that we're heading towards now seems to be kind of fulfilling like that particular passage. Now, the really interesting part I found, besides this sort of like, what if we find something as we go and look, or what if something looks for us, or we can find something in another star system and now with all the exoplanets that we're finding mm. these become possibilities um and uh, al like you said um uh or maybe we talked about it later it, before the idea of an of um avatar the movie avatar and how, yeah. how can, can we can we find these places and suddenly mow over them this is all becoming no longer science fiction it's the possibility now of our science present mm -hmm. it's not a, it's it, that, this is what i see but i want to cover two things about this report it was bringing together all the you know so-called best minds at the time to to project out what would happen to humanity and some of their concerns were getting a cl global um satellite how did they put it global satellite web or network in place that everybody could get information really quickly. Like that's like when I was that's reading, a 5G nightmare. <laughs> well, they were they were prefiguring this stuff. Mm. They were they were already. I mean, I don't know if this, these plans were already in place, but it's like it sure seems like it. Another one they wanted to do was they they it was recommended to NASA to develop a social sciences uh, approach or social sciences division. In other words, the humanities. Mm -hmm. And I you know and that makes sense how we would be affected by all of these changes, these possibilities, this chance that there might be, you know, remnants throughout our solar system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, who they were, this kind of thing. But another thing they wanted to track, because remember, this was a time when the power of TV was making an impact, you know, definitely in the United States. There was more and more people having a television set, and there was lots of studies. If you look at the at the appendix of this of this document. It's really interesting, all the sort of reports and the studies that they cite, mm -hmm. um, because NASA was very interested in the power of television, which then links us back to what Disney knew and how to basically, quote unquote, sell yeah. a space program to the American public. Um, but the one they really wanted to track was children. And they said, it is really important to follow the children, the progress of the children, and their attitudes about space. Right. Because they said children are the, the future. are the messenger yeah. of change, yes. Yeah. And it's so funny because my – well, our, our mutual friend there, Laura London, she came up with the term, we are the Brookings babies. <laughs> and she's right, right man. Yeah. I When I was reading this – when I read this document – I had this epiphany. I mean, we've been talking almost about a rel religiosity of finding this material. And again, mm. I really recommend to your listeners that, you know, if this does, you know, if if they can just go and Google any of this stuff, and you will find you'll find a lot of weird stuff. And I'll give you 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 some um, websites to go to that are really really very good with some excellent articles. Mm. But go and look it up, and you'll find just a plethora of material out there. Not only websites, and again, some of it is going to be really fringy, and some of it's going to be 
a little bit forced, but if you find the really cogent um, researchers, you're going to go on a real trippy experience. Yeah. That, that, that's what happened with me because I, I just went amok in some of the databases that was available back in the day online. Yeah. And like I said, I only remember uh, right now, I just remember Joseph Skipper's right, yeah, work. Right. But there were others too. And, and, and Richard was one of them. I mean, Richard's been around yeah, forever. In fact, I think we should kudos some of the old timers. Are, are you, by the way, familiar with a chap called, uh, uh, what's his name again? Gigi Hurtek or something like that? Yes, yeah, he I He was have. very early on with some of the same yeah. stuff that Richards did. Yeah, yeah. But, no, but he went into spirituality, I think. Well, that's what this material does, yeah. Al. Like I said, like I, when, I first, when I first really started to look at the stuff close up, not so much the satellite imagery, although that is incredible, yeah. but it, the really close up stuff and what looks like yeah. what's close up, we, we start to see, again, coming back to Gale Crater, because that's our best imagery right now, in our, and, and well, it's, it's American, but we all get to share in it. We're seeing right up close to the what look like ceremonial structures on the way to the central, quote unquote, mountain, which is called Aeolus Mons, or better known as Mount Sharp. And mm. this is my point. I, I said this earlier. I wanted to set this up. There are traverse maps that are put on the Curiosity Rover's website showing not just where it's been, not just where it is currently, but where it's going to go. And I had this discussion with Keith Laney about this. I said, Keith, why on the tra tra traverse map do they show this is where the rover is going to be, and yet they show all these little side routes, and they say, well, it's not there yet, but this is how we're going to get there. Why would there be so many little offshoots? And he goes, well, that's because they're already there, mm. and, they're just li and they're just lying. Yeah. And I said, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. So this is how they can stay ahead of the – and what, what Keith has, has noted, going back to sort of NASA still playing games, is not only do they – you kind of manipulate the colors. It's funny. One of our other colleagues calls the coloring uh, baby puke green or something. I forget what he calls it, but they, they almost put this like this layer of, of, of grossness over the images, and you kind of have to filter that out so yeah. you can see things more clearly. And it's amazing how, how different they become when you do just base – because some of the skeptics, Andy Bernkes, they think – we are manipulating the pictures. Right. But, but when, uh, and I guess a picture expert should explain it. No, no, no. When you are, you know, you can take any picture you want that doesn't have anything in it and you can put them through the same filters and nothing will yeah. show up, right? Yes, That's right. the thing. That's the thing. So nobody's adding, n nobody in serious research is adding anything to it. No. They're just removing what has been polluted on it. Exactly. And that's amazing. Oh, it's, it's, and some of the technology now, like, um, one of the ones I well, let me finish what I was going to say. So yeah. the, the yeah. rover is is literally following what we think is almost a ceremonial Pattern. alleyway. Right. Yeah, like a, right. uh, but it's it's almost looks like 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 what you would see in Central America or in Egypt, almost like a central thoroughfare mm. with these ceremonial structures that well, NASA's calling mesas. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all, of course. Remember, we think that it was the, the planet was pulverized by a, a blast of ast, you know, of, of a, a basically a broken planet. Mm -hmm. Then a, an ensuing tsunami washed over. So all of this crap and mud just covered everything. Millions, uh, potentially tens of millions, or millions, or hundreds of thousands, or you know, again, the, the dates are all muddled. But all this time of you know, slowly losing the atmosphere, it becomes thinner. It's not the same geological pro – I mean there are some same geological processes because of the winds. There's uh, these high winds. So you, th yeah. th all this material gets blasted by the winds and in these harsh sands, and everything gets buried. Mm -hmm. And remember what happened to the um, Sphinx a number of times in our history. It was buried yeah. By, yeah. by sand. This is what we see in Gale Crater is that – can you imagine if we were there and just – could get a big giant mouth and blow away all the sand. What yeah. might just appear in front of us? Yeah. And what? So what Keith believes is that the rover is literally following a ceremonial pathway up Mount Sharp, which we potentially think is not so much a, a dormant volcano or some sort of geological mountain, but it could be another one of these ancient arcologies. And if that's the case, it could be what might have been more of an original thing because what we think we're seeing 
in a lot of this imagery. And Mars is the easiest one to sort of, you know, kind of extrapolate this concept is that it might have been a succeeding series of civilizations that literally declined. And does that mm. not sound familiar in terms of Earth? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a universal principle. If there's yeah. life, there, there, there has to be layers of life, just like here. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, they would have to, in order to know more, they would have to have to explore it like they would do on Earth. And and I, I tend to agree with him that when they leak out things, or not just leak, but when they actually come clean with things, if they want to keep control over this information, they cannot go out with something they don't know every angle and odds and ends about. They have to, yeah. like... Okay, we we know everything now. This is in our pocket. Now we can choose what to. But but I don't still don't understand what's up with uh, why would India, for example, follow that playbook? Uh, there has to be some kind of control mechanism going on. Well, that's exactly what I think, man. I think that again. I think we we sort of we're circling back again. But I think that what we see is these. Did you know that I, I think it's the United Emirates. I think they have a space program too. But there was one of the one of the um, Arabic countries has a space program that they want to kick up and get going. I can't remember which one exactly it is. But even the Israelis had one because they were trying to to land a probe on the moon. I like, would assume the Israelis uh, they're probably yeah. deeply in tied with the American anyway. But I'll, I'll give you the the real canary in the mine. Yeah, you know the religious nut Nazi dictator of Turkey. Mm. Who's who's ruined that promising country? He has started to <clears throat> ramble about wanting to do this. Now he has no incentive in the world to do that. Oh, wow. In fact, he want to become the new sultan, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So he is obviously he, he's clued in on something's going on, and um, I guess we'll all know in a few years if they go coming out with something because even if they're giving us a drop. We can then infer from that, we can infer an ocean, you know? Well, he here's an answer for you in terms of these groups kind of yeah. going mum on things. So uh, one of the images from the European Space Agency probe, uh, Rosetta, we, we started to go into that. Was they, they basically chased down a comet, and that comet was called 67P. Now, there is uh, – uh, the, the, well, there was two um, former Soviet astronomers that discovered it. I'm not mm. even going to try to say their names, Al, because <laughs> I'm going to totally yeah. brutalize it. But 67P, <laughs> Comet 67P, look it up. You can go right to Wikipedia or any of the articles, and you'll or even straight to ESA, and they'll go give you all that. But this um, probe was back in I th uh, I'll get my dates all screwed up. It might have been 2000. 15, but anyway, anyways, it basically visited. The comet, and it's a near – well, it's considered a near-Earth object because it goes on this sort of elliptical um, orbit. Or it gets quite close to the sun, outgasses a lot, and then it whips right back out – way out into like – I think it goes beyond or right around near Jupiter and then comes around again. So when it – on its closest pass, when they could get all the mathematics right, they sent this probe out. And they literally – caught a comet like you know it's literally the saying they did it yeah. well it was some very interesting imagery came out of that again because what this object was was a what they call a a bilobal object so it basically it's like two pieces kind of fused together and it's so interesting to listen to these these groups talk about how these these uh, formations happen. They talk about it's a, like a gentle fusing, and I, I guess so. I mean, I'm not a, a, a you know a planetary scientist, so I don't know. But what we you know at first when we saw Comet 67P, it was like the only one that's a by by uh, by by um, uh, a two a two a two lobed object. And then we started to see, oh no, in fact, there's either other ones that are have very similar shapes, and it's like, oh, so. Now nature gently fuses objects together, and and Al, it mm. could it could be maybe the for or Al, are we looking at a model? Are we looking at a spaceship model? Right. Are we looking at an ancient space pat platform that's within our solar system that's been battered, been bashed, been beaten? I, I, I speaking of that, I'm going to interview the author of the book. I don't know if you heard it, but the title says it all. Who built the moon? Ah, oh. <laughs> great book, by the way. So, so yeah, talking about spaceships, but go on. Well, so 
oh, I have so many thoughts, but yeah. <laughs> this one image, this one image. So, so again with Essa, and now that the the Rosetta probe is now been crashed into the into the asteroid because they did all their science and then it ran out of out of its life, et cetera, et cetera. And they also had a lander. It was called the Philae lander, and it was like the size of a small or a fairly large fridge. And it mm-hmm. literally landed on this thing, and it took pictures. And it's again, you can look all this up online. Go to Essa. Go to their um, Rosetta mission probe or their Rosetta probe mission. Go to their images of the day, and you will find stunning imagery of this, what they're calling a comet, which is, to me, anything but a comet. But, but, but wasn't the same thing going on with Phobos and uh, what's the other one? Uh, the two moons of Demos. Mars? Demos. Yeah, Demos. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting one because um, you don't hear a lot about Demos, but Phobos for sure – uh that's funny i was on a show recently talking about this and we were saying how strange and artificial that piece looks because that too mm. looks like a a literally a, a a decaying space arcology because what you're starting to see on on phobos is these parallel running lines oh and what i mean by okay again look it up if you're listening to this broadcast just go look it up go look up phobos look at the close-up beautiful imagery and you'll see these weird patterns that look like owl ancient decking and mm-hmm. the way the way that nasa describes it they say oh no 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 those lines those long 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 straight lines that go in parallel tracks beside each other and crisscross at perfect right angles they are caused by boulders that gently rolled along the surface and just made impressions as they went along. Very, very orderly boulders. Oh, I'm telling it's you, it's funny how intelligent the boulders in outer space is. We never see that in our with our boulders. I when I read that, I'm like, <laughs> are you guys for real? Like, do you think yeah. we're that that stupid? Like, I, anyways, no, they should stick to the old script of uh, being in the photo. But maybe they can't because of the photo specialists now. Oh, but they used to say, no, no, this is an aspect of the. Uh, photo itself oh you know, you the old, old like photos a, like a noise or some sort of artifact or yeah, something yeah or something in the yeah. process of creating the photo and blah 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 no they i can't. mean some sometimes it is true like all these uh, lines in the old nasa photos is yeah um, yeah yeah there right? yeah there's there definitely but when you see these images no it, it, it no, no. <laughs> like this no. is this is literally this is why we have uh, image experts uh, involved right yeah. precisely because they, that's the first go to explanation yeah. and if we can you know no this is real then we have to discuss one well what is it yeah well and the other thing about the phobos and demos is that they're basically retrograding in their orbits they're going to eventually crash into mars and uh, you know, there's wow. a lot of different explanations for that, but here's another quality. I mean, it's a very that that. Oh my gosh, we could go on forever with that one. But <laughs> another thing about Phobos is that at first it was thought to be a solid, you know, rock, yeah. and then there was a probe again in the mid, you know, mid thousands there or whatever, twelve, two thousand twelve in that area. Essa sent a probe, and they soon discovered that there are hollow spaces inside this thing and this confirmed again another blog or article by richard saying that it's an empty space now they're calling it rooms but they're massive and i mean sorry they're not calling it rooms they're calling it massive hollowed out areas and then they're trying to explain it as well no it's a collection of they admit it okay oh Mm -hmm. they admit it oh they but Mm -hmm. they say it's a collection of rocks that have fused together to make these spaces which again could be true but it sure is extraordinary. How, how the hell do they know? Uh, <laughs> I mean, if they ever could to come up with an alternative explanation, sure, sure. But they're claiming it as if it's sure. Have they sent yeah. their probes there or with a manned space there and checked it out? Maybe they have. Well, I mean, uh, Space Force didn't come out of nowhere. Certainly uh, didn't come out of Trump's fantasy. Well, and especially when Trump said, we're going to make another Space Force. That was a big, weird statement. Oh no, did he slip up like that? He said I didn't that. Catch that. When it first came out, he says, We're going to make a space force. We're going to make another space force. And it's like, What? Yeah. Did you mean that? He slips up all the time. Yeah. Oh. But but he, he is uh, so loyal to the military industrial complex. I guess he had to, because I don't think you can be a president and survive in that chair, uh, literally or figuratively, without allying with one of the big power 
groups and obviously that's the biggest one so so that's uh, it's perfect because he gives them whatever they want there's not it's like oh, yeah. wild west there now no checks and balances on anything under a guy like obama there's going to be a um, at least a, a semblance of it at least the power networks connected to obama will have some kind of checks and balances but right now these private contractors are running Probably that's part of why the Intel hates him. But they're running havoc. They're having a field day. The profits are sky high. They, they can do about anything without any repercussion whatsoever. Yeah. So, um, but you know, that would probably boost. It, it, it's kind of interesting because when you go off the playbook that they've been keeping, and I'm not supporting this, I'm just seeing a silver lining. And that's that when they go off the playbook like this, Something's going to be screwed up. Yeah. Something's going to happen. Uh, it's going to be like Richard uh, Dolan scenario, right? Because there's no control anymore. Yeah. Not even those who want to paint the paradigm for us <laughs> have so yeah. much control. And that's when, uh, yeah, something interesting is going to happen. And just, just the fact, the small thing you said that he slipped up in, um, when he talked about it, but he said other stuff too that infers what's been going on. So, yeah. So, but it's, you know what? I think we should take a break now. Okay. Uh, we've been um, uh, covering many bases. Uh, we have uh, like uh, some specifics. In part two, I want to go a little down to earth. By that, I mean, I want to give people examples of some of the greatest stuff they can watch. If they've never seen any, any of this stuff before, we should direct them. And also to, to some of the hard uh, researchers in the field, I think we should kudos them too. Okay. Sounds, Sounds okay? okay? Sounds good. Cool. cool. All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show, you can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks. Thanks.